Hello and welcome to our webinar today um, hosted by InsideSales.com. We're going to be talking about the perfect sales demo, less product and more prospect. Um, excited to introduce the man of the hour. Um, but before I do that, uh, we want to play a short clip uh, while we have a couple other people join. Um, and I'm going to do that now. Majestic Billings. This is my second year at Code Camp. After Code Camp last year, I still continued programming and I was invited to actually teach programming with HTML and CSS to college students. And I have been asked to be a member of the SDS team, which is a team of scratchers, people that use scratch. Usually programming tutorials are just a page that says do this and you'll have this result, but at the coding camp they actually explain why you do this and things like that. to code because you can do anything with coding. You can create something that is impossible in real life, like a flying tree with rainbow leaves. All right, fantastic. Let's get, uh, let's get into the nitty gritty here. So a couple housekeeping items before we begin. One, you're seeing on the screen here, i got to make a plug for our podcast, the InsideSales.com podcast. If you haven't checked it out, myself, co-host Steve there, talking about real problems, real solutions uh, with real people. We do two episodes a week. Uh, check it out at InsideSales.com podcast and subscribe and leave a review. Um, we do have a great downloadable that you can see here in your on24 screen it's how inside sales.com and consensus excuse me work together you may need to refresh your screen um, to get that but that's a great downloadable that I'd recommend you pull I'm going to turn it over here to our co-presenter here in just a second we will have a Q&A session at the end so if you do want to ask Q&A um, either at the end or jump in and do it during we'll also answer any Q&A kind of as the session goes on. I'd love to, while I'm kind of chatting here, there's a little box down there that says Q&A. If you can type in your name and where you're coming from, um, meaning state or uh, city, just so I make sure you understand that, uh, that Q&A box. I really want this to be interactive, and I know Matt does as well. Um, if you can go ahead and do that, looks like we've got some people coming in. Tom, Mary, Susan, uh, perfect. That's what I'm looking for. Good. So without further ado, um, let's get into kind of the, the meat of the show here. Um, I'm myself. I'm Gabe Larson, director of InsideSales.com Labs. Um, been with the company three years, excited about the conversation of really getting better at our demos today. Um, I'm going to let Matt just probably do a little bit of introduction with himself, but um, I gotta say, the guy's been in software sales technology for a long time, co-founder and CRO of Consensus, formerly Demo Chimp, for those of you who are familiar with that name. Um, but he's been growing sales systems in tech companies for a full decade. Funny story, in, he actually started a call center in the Philippines and one of his competitors chopped his legs off by getting the police involved and trying to actually uh, shut him down. So the guy's been doing it not only in the U.S., but overseas. Matt, anything else uh, you, you'd add to your introduction? Oh, Matt, did I lose you? Uh-oh, Matt might be having some uh, technical difficulties. Matt, if you're on mute, jump off mute. 
and join us. We're 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 anxious to to hear from you. Um, <laughs> Matt, are you still there? I'm just chatting Matt now to see if I can get him back in. He's had a couple technical difficulties. He's dialing back in. Um, so we'll skip his introduction um, and go right into kind of the session um, as he jumps back in. But I'm really excited about the topic at hand. Consensus is a great partnership with InsideSales.com. And we're going to be diving into these six areas that I think are going to really show you how to be thinking about doing demos slightly differently. In the old world, it was um, just going through product and features. In the new world, there's some really interesting stuff and some data that Matt and Consensus are bringing to the table, not just through some of their research, but through their technology as well. Stuff we're seeing in the brain and how people are thinking. The power of storytelling, this one is fascinating. Some of the research and how it can really bring people into your environment and just lock them in as you move forward. Um, these three laws of persuasion um, and some of the data behind Hello? what people are thinking in ordering to act. Oh, does that matter? Are you back? I'm here. Fantastic. I don't know what happened. I could. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you were just fine. I did a, I did a subpar introduction of you. Um, and I was just going over kind of the agenda here, talking about some okay. of the things around storytelling, the three laws of persuasion, um, and then as we get into the demo, and, and oh, I think that the example um, that Matt's put at the end is, is pretty darn powerful. But Matt, maybe you can – I'll hand it over to you quickly, just briefly to hit this introduction on the agenda, and let's dive into the, the fun stuff. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I think I was in shock for, uh, because you brought up that painful, painful memory of mine. Um, <laughs> oh, you did being in the, the Philippines. You did the Philippines. <laughs> I did hear that. Yeah, experiencing the joys of international business and uh, getting put out of business um, in an underhanded way. I I actually made it out of the country okay, but my partner spent 30 days in a Filipino prison before finally right. bribing his way out. It's yeah, it's a crazy story. It should be a movie. I'll have to tell you sometime. Um, so yeah, so I'm really excited about this topic. It's something I'm very passionate about. I um, a long, long time ago in my undergrad, uh, I was studying psychology. Thought I wanted to be I don't know a therapist. Realized that was a horrible thing for me, but the love for psychology stuck and. Uh, the study study of the brain and and behavior has always been um, uh, one of my biggest hobbies. So it's worked well as I've gone into software sales and marketing and and trying to understand how to best interact with with people on an individual level and at scale. Uh, and so today I'm really excited to be sort of presenting a lot of the things that I've learned over the years. Um, uh, in terms of uh, brain function and why that matters for demoing and, and selling, um, how why storytelling matters. Um, a lot of what we talk about today is going to be studying um, uh, storytelling and how to work that into your demo. Um, I've been on the receiving end of hundreds of demos, and uh, I can actually recall two companies that ever told stories uh, and after we look at the research today, I think that's going to be – you're going to be as shocked about that as I am right now. Um, and so so we'll get into – so you know, get, I, I apologize, Gabe, if you introduced these already. I, I didn't hear that portion of it before I dropped off. But um, we'll talk about three laws of persuasion and, and that we've learned from TED Talks. Uh, so that should be really interesting. Then I'm actually going to give you a framework of how to create your story, uh, the one you should be using in your demo. And then another framework for what you should be doing pre-demo, during the demo, and post-demo uh, to give your client uh, the perfect experience. Um, so let's get into that. So, um, whoops, here we go. Okay, so what you should walk away with, uh, it's a plan for creating your own brain, mess, uh, brain massaging, highly persuasive, memorable, story-based, interactive demo framework or your world's best demo. 
So it's going to be, uh, you know, the, it's it's going to differ industry to industry. So it really, um, you know, I'll give you some examples, but really be thinking, of course, how this applies to you. Uh, and I think the framework should give you the ability to uh, walk away with what you need. So uh, let me get to, sorry, it's skipped a little bit. Here we go. Okay. Okay, so I want to start with uh, a story. So if any of you have ever heard of uh, a gentleman named Paul Zak, he was a neurologist at Berkeley, and he did some fascinating research. He started, uh, th his research was based around this story. And as you can see in this picture, uh, there's a, a son, a boy named David, uh, and his father, Ben. And David was... His father, the story essentially talked about how uh, David's father had a really hard time being ha happy around David and uh, because uh, David had cancer and David's father uh, knew that he only had, you know, three to six months to live. Uh, now, David didn't really understand this, <clears throat> and so he was, you know, he he was very happy when he was playing, and so the story was about how his father really struggled uh, to to see that, to be around his son that was so happy when he, as a father, sort of had this impending uh, fear in the back of his mind. Um, and so, so this was a story. I, I apologize for starting with such a uh, such a heavy story, but there's likely an interesting thing happening to to each of you that that heard that story, and it's the same thing that. Uh, that Paul Zach discovered in his research. So, interestingly, he he was he he knew that that story had a profound effect on people, um, and so he decided to take blood samples before and after telling that story. Now, what happened? What we discovered was is that cortisol levels increased and oxytocin levels increased. And so, if you um, if those are familiar to you at all. Oxytocin uh, increases empathy, feelings of caring, and feelings of connection. And <clears throat> cortisol uh, is basically the, the hormone that uh, focuses our attention on something, gives us the ability to focus. So those are two very critical uh, things that need to happen in, 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 a sale, you know, in a sales process. Obviously, it's a different thing thinking about the story that I told in, in a sale, but the research was very interesting in that those that heard the story, oh, I'm sorry, so after they told them the story, they gave them a chance to donate money um, to a charity. And so the people that heard the story donated money. The people that did not hear the story did not donate money. Um, it was that the story had a very profound effect. Now, what was interesting is, is they re-ran the study, but this time trying to predict who would donate and how much they would donate uh, based on, on some different uh, uh, things that they were measuring, heart rate, brain function, uh, things like that correlated with the, the data that they had before from taking the blood samples. And what they found was that they, they could actually predict how much people would donate with 80% accuracy, which is incredible in a scenario like that, just, just the impact of a story. So what does this have to do with, with sales and giving the perfect demo? Well, stories change our brain chemistry. It's a fact, and they affect the way that we remember and the way that we make decisions. So remembering what a sales rep is saying and using that to make decisions is, is the essence of, the, of, the, of purchasing behavior. Um, now, what's interesting here is that why this matters even more is that there's a massive problem in the B2B sales industry. Um, some of you, if you've watched some of some other things that I've presented on, you may have seen this, but um, it remains uh, one of the largest problems in B2B sales. So, it, you know, if it takes four months to train a rep and then a rep is spending, you know, one to two hours with a, with a mobilizer or that, you know, your prospect, then that prospect says, hey, thanks for the information. I'm going to go back and talk to my team, you know, the, the rest of those stakeholders. Uh, they're actually, 
typically a sales rep is giving them facts, giving them dry descriptions of a use case, uh, things like that. And those are difficult to communicate with accuracy and emotion and uh, really influence. Um, uh, one, because the, the mobilizer doesn't know it very well. They're not good at it. Um, but another thing, because it's difficult for them to connect powerfully with these other stakeholders. So they need to be telling stories, right? So that's why this I am, I'm emphasizing this so much. Now, typically, most people are kind of focused, you know, most sales professionals are focused on this interaction with the mobilizer. Um, but if you're doing it correctly, if you're giving the best demo possible, um, you absolutely need to be emphasizing coaching the buying process, uh, working with that, enabling that mobilizer in a way that they can tell amazing stories uh, and that uh, the, the, uh, the, the broader stakeholder buying group has everything that they need to make a, a confident purchase decision. So, um, yeah, so today there's a lot that goes into that, and um, we, we sh should do another, we'll do a, another webinar on that, I'm sure, down the road. But this is really about how to, and how to during the demo, how to equip uh, your mobilizer or your sales champion with stories that they can then use to go tell internally. Uh, so uh, even more, you know, uh, this is from the Challenger Customer, uh, which is this, uh, the sequel book to the Challenger Sale written by CEB. 80% of buyers, <coughs> excuse me, want more support from suppliers in communicating the value of the solutions that they championed. So they really struggled with this. And what the industry doesn't seem to recognize yet is that they're just lacking stories. So let's get into um, the uh, kind of a story framework and the power of um, of persuasion, I guess, that's inside of these stories. So this is this I pulled from uh, a presentation about a book called Talk Like Ted. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with TED Talks. <clears throat> They've had over a billion views uh, at this point, uh, which is absolutely incredible. <laughs> and TED Talks tend to follow a, a pretty specific formula. So there's some, lear there's some learning that can be had from studying TED Talks that um, this book, Talk Like TED, uh, explains. Um, it really breaks it down to three things. that they, It has to be emotional, has to touch your heart, has to be novel or new, um, and it has to be memorable, you know, presented in a way that, that they won't forget. So uh, just looking at this a little bit, Oops, sorry, keep skipping slides. Um, okay, so in order for, for making it emotional, it really starts with the sales rep. The sales rep has to find a way to feel passionate about what they're talking about. Um, you know, Larry Smith said, "Passion is the thing that will help you create the highest expression of your talent." When you feel passionate about something, uh, oh, is is uh, audio cutting out for more people? Quentin said it's cutting out for him or her. No, it seems to be working. It's working fine for me. Okay. I'll keep going. And, we'll, keep watching. Yeah, okay. we'll keep watching. Okay, great. So, so, so you know, when we're talking about um, the perfect demo, you have to lead with passion. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, well, how can I feel passionate about accounting software or, you know, whatever your product is? And that can be a difficult thing to figure out. For me, what it's really come down to is finding something about the problem that the product solves that I care about. I really, when I'm sell selling software or selling anything, I really find passion in helping the person that I'm talking to to solve a problem that's meaningful for them. That's where I find passion in really being able to sell anything and feel passionate about it. So I would recommend, you know, really focusing in on what's that problem that you can solve that makes a difference in the person's life uh, and, and let that fuel your passion. Now, uh, it's interesting, there more research, I won't go deep on this, but research has shown that passion is actually contagious. It's, this is not just a feel-good thing, this is an actual tactic to help you sell more. If you can be passionate about what you're selling, you will have more influence over the people that you're talking to. Um, so their, their research basically said if you meet someone who's genuinely passionate about a product or idea, 
it will influence your perception of that product or idea. So uh, really important to have passion. Now, uh, second or you know equally as important is the art of storytelling. So uh, looking again at the brain on stories, so at Princeton University, Yuri Hassan does research on storytelling by attaching electrodes to people. He finds that when somebody tells a story, certain parts of the brain light up. And why is this interesting? Um, well, the, what he, his research went on to show is that the parts of the brain that were lighting up in the storyteller were actually the same parts of the brain that were lighting up in the listener. And so uh, they tested it against other things and found that when you're telling a story, so using, when I say story, I'm talking about the correct structure for a story. When you're telling a story that, that resonates with the person, your brains are lighting up in the same way and you feel this connection. It's a really fascinating thing. Um, uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing, definitely look into it. Let's get on to the second part of this. So we talked about it being emotional, right? Bringing passion and using storytelling. Uh, I'll teach more about storytelling in a moment, but it also has to be novel or new. CEB talks about this as being a commercial insight um, if you've studied uh, their, their materials. Um, but really, biologically, a fresh, new, and unexpected twist on an old idea releases dopamine, which is your brain's natural save button. Um, there's, there was an interesting study done that uh, it, was, it was looking at students and memory and trying to figure out what the best tactic was for memorizing something. Um, and so a lot of, most people think that repetition is the best way to, to remember something, but repetition actually didn't correlate uh, with increased memory, in an, amazingly. Uh, you could, uh, it just doesn't correlate. Um, what does correlate, though, is heightened emotion. If you're experiencing heightened emotion, uh, you remember. So uh, you remember more of it. So, uh, <clears throat> so making something new um, triggers emotion, typically, right? It's surprise or it's, it's shock or, or just a, a fascination with something new um, increases memory. Uh, so moving on to the third thing uh, that this book talks about as being key to uh, great presenting or uh, is making it memorable. Now, what this really boils down to, uh, at least from the way that they approached it, um, is a couple of things. Contro making sure that, uh, you know, the obvious things, don't talk too long. Uh, and then the other thing is, uh, so in sales, you know, you break that up with questions. Nobody likes to sit and listen to a, a 20, 30 minute demo without talking. Um, this was really, so this is a really interesting thing that they found. Speaking for too long results in cognitive backlog, which like piling on weights makes the mental load on your audience heavier and heavier until they forget everything that you said. Uh, so it's really, really interesting, right? People think they're giving more and more of this quality information, but what they're really doing is ruining their chances of having their, the, the, the client remember anything that they're saying and be able to communicate that to the, to the other stakeholders. So you're literally hurting your chances by not simplifying your message down to a story that's very memorable. Hey, Matt, uh, Matt, Matt a couple questions. Yeah. Real, real quick to interrupt, a couple couple points or uh, maybe questions that have, that have come through. One that's probably particular here is just about timing. I mean, you mentioned, you know, people don't want to be talked at for 20, 30 minutes. Do you have any good um, thoughts or, or data research uh, around times? Meaning, you know, if you're going to do a demo for somebody, should you keep it at a certain length or should you try to chunk it? You only talk for a certain amount of time and then turn it over to them or how would you coach somebody on timing? Yeah, so I would break it up into sections. I would never talk for more than three to four minutes at a time without getting some kind of feedback. Um, so that, that's kind of a, my general feeling. And I'm going to actually, later when I show the framework on kind of giving a, an amazing demo, um, I think you'll see how I recommend breaking up. So if it's okay, I'll, I'll do that a little later. Um, okay, so yeah, was it? Were the, were, was that it? 
Nope, that's good. You're good for now. Okay, awesome. So, so moving on, so pictures end up being a really key part to making something more memorable. So if you hear information delivered verbally, you'll remember 10%. If, it, if there's a picture, retention source to 65%. So really fascinating there. One thing that I really want to point out here is that there's been this trend in the industry of people talking about death by PowerPoint. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, sales reps, oh, I, I don't want to use a PowerPoint. I don't want to present that way. Well, death by PowerPoint is simply talking too, for too long and presenting information that isn't personalized or isn't in the context of their business. The pictures that you can use in PowerPoint or the way that PowerPoint can uh, allow you to tell a story is still unmatched outside of video. Um, and in video, it's, you can't necessarily personalize it. So don't shy away from PowerPoint. Just make your PowerPoints amazing and make sure that they support your story in the way that I'll talk about in, in a second. Um, oh, let me. Okay, so, so what this all kind of boils down to is that, uh, at least the, the, uh, the, the physiological side of it, is that we are hardwired to respond to the hero's journey story. Um, there's a lot of research uh, that backs this up, but that's the way that people have been teaching people for thousands of years. It's through this hero's journey story. Um, re research this if, if, uh, you know, if you're interested in this kind of thing because it's fascinating how they discovered that the hero's journey story was being told you know, thousands of years ago. Um, but <clears throat> that, so be, we are hardwired that when the hero's journey is presented to us, we produce oxytocin, right? It feels good. And those, the other hormones that I talked about, right, it increases empathy and it uh, um, increases memorability. So what I'm going to uh, explain right now is how you build a hero's journey story, taking into it to account all the things that we've talked about so far and work that into a sales demo. Um, okay. So uh, there are a number of things, elements to this story that are really critical. Uh, First, it starts with a relatable hero. That's your target customer. We've heard this, you know, you know across sales, there's, uh, you know, recommendations a thousand times a day on Twitter that say, it's not about you, it's about your customer. Um, but what most sales reps tend to do naturally is they try to talk about themselves or the product or the company that they represent as the hero, um, but it's not. The hero has to be the target customer, and you'll see why in a second. The next element to it is that you have to describe the world that they exist in. They have to have relatable context. Uh, I'm just going to go quickly through this and then give you an example of the story uh, and then summarize these points again. The third element is that there has to be a call to adventure, right? So there has to be a problem that, that the hero has to solve. Again, this is the problem that the hero is solving uh, not the problem that, you know, your product solves necessarily yet. Um, the next element is that you ha there has to be a potential failure. You have to explore what it's like to, to fail, what the consequences could be. Um, a really important element in, this, in, in these, story, uh, these hero's journey stories to make it interesting. Um, and, you know, a lot, a lot of times this shows up as, uh, or the way that CEB talks about it, it's, a, it's the implications of not solving the problem. Um, so um, next shows up a helper. Now this one's kind of difficult to understand as you're thinking about this, this product. A lot of times it's, hey, you know, let's say for, for consensus, you know, um, if I was doing this incorrectly, I might say, well, I've got my, you know, we sell to sales reps that use insidesales.com. Uh, and they, you know, we help them to reach more stakeholders and deliver personalized uh, automated demos. Uh, and so, you know, that's how consensus is going to save the day. Um, what's, what's different about a correct story versus an incorrect story, a correct story actually positions you as helping the hero to achieve their goal rather than, you know, focusing uh, taking a, a more narrow approach and saying, you know, here's a general problem in the market and here's how we solve it and we're the hero. 
So um, it's really interesting, and this will become more clear as I show the example in a moment. The next element to the hero's journey story is the magical item. So uh, this is your offer, your brand promise. This uh, example from Forever Spin, um, you know, as they're telling their story, this is it, th they're selling tops, right? Spinning tops. But this was one of, one of the most successful Kickstarter campaigns um, in the history of Kickstarter. And if you just read this, it comes through clearly. Every spinning top that leaves our hands to become part of your life. Right, right there, it's become more than a spinning top. It's become there's a brand promise that they're going to deliver something meaning in your life, and we mean every single one is built on the same belief that a top is more than just a toy. That above all, a top must be absolutely simple, elegant, and built forever. In these stories, your brand promise becomes really important because it's connecting with them on an emotional level and saying, "Hey, you're simple. You're elegant." Um, you're built forever. That may not may, may, you know, make sense literally, but it would cause them to connect with it emotionally. So the next element is that at this point in the story, there has to be a glimpse at failing, a trial of alternatives. What would happen if they took one road versus the other? And an exploration of that. And then uh, uh, the triumphant return. They made the right decision. They live happily ever after. They return back to that world that you described earlier, uh, but they're better having gone through the journey. So, so let me summarize. You have to have a hero. That's your prospect. You have to explain their world. That's the context and the problem that they're living in. Uh, you have to explore failure, what the consequences would be. Um, you have to, they have to find hope. Uh, and then, which is your brand promise, and then there has to be an offer, um, and that's basically how you can help. So it goes brand promise, and then how you can help is more specifically how the hero can use your offer to succeed. Then they have to face the trial, right? They're looking at alternatives, and then they're successful, and they have the, the, the successful journey home, I guess, or the, the happily ever after. So let me give you an example of this. This is a lot of text, but I'm just going to read it. I want you to not read along with me and just listen. So here, I want to talk to you about a sales rep that uses InsideSales.com. He's very hardworking. He's bright. He does everything he can to be successful, especially leveraging the IS technologies. His company has good intentions, but they don't always treat him well or enable him well enough. He hits quotas sometimes, but he's driven to crush it for his family and for his career, and he's worried that missing quota means his career potential takes a hit. So one day, he realized that he was relying too much on sales champions. He wasn't getting the right messaging to all the right stakeholders. He knew that if he didn't fix it, he would keep producing mediocre quarterly numbers and be stuck in his current role for too long with an average close rate. When checking his email one day, he saw an invitation to watch an automated personalized demo from Consensus, and an idea clicked for him. He could, send, he, he could send automated demos that personalized messaging to each stakeholder. For a moment, he considered just sending static videos or PDFs, but realized that few would view it without the messaging being personalized, and he wouldn't get the amazing discovery insights that Consensus promised. So he fought to get consensus in his organization, and he implemented it with intensity. At the next quarterly sales meeting, he reported impressive close rates, a faster sales cycle, and 120% quota attainment. He went on to lead the team six months later. So this is an example, uh, an example of the hero's journey, uh, as, as told in the you know, of con consensus, but the hero is the sales rep. Now, a sales rep is going to identify with this 100 times more than they're going to identify with a, a simple demo that's, uh, that it shows the features and what they can do. Um, this is a story where they can say, that's me. And that's a story that they can go tell other sales reps. It's a story they can go tell their, their leaders um, and try to drive change in the organization. It's a story that is memorable to them because it hits home in terms of, hey, I'm fighting for my family and for my career, 
And, and this problem of not being able to get the right messaging to the right stakeholders um, and not coaching, you know, being able to coach the buying process is hurting my ability to be the hero. So all of this sort of happens subconsciously, right? Now, you wouldn't just read a story to your client, of course, like this. So that's what I want to get into next is, uh, <clears throat> is sort of how you're working this story into an actual demo. Um, so just a reminder, right, you're, you want to use images, uh, ask questions at the right times to make it memorable and emotional and, and, of course, interactive. Again, you don't want to be talking for too long. So the, the, next, three, the next things that I want to show you um, are getting into um, – so I just realized there are a couple of questions asking for something that I don't have in this presentation, but – there's enough people asking for it. I'm going to create it and uh, make sure that we get it out to everybody. Um, so, uh, the, so what I'm going to talk about now are, are basically kind of shifting gears. We've talked about stories a lot. The question remains, how do you work a story into uh, the perfect demo? Um, uh, right now, I'm going to talk about a framework for the demo, and then we'll get back to melding the two together. So, the pre-demo checklist, these are things that you should be doing before every demo to make sure that you're personalizing information uh, and um, uh, among other things. So this is just what our sales team does and what I recommend. Uh, you need to understand the person. You can check Google, Twitter, Facebook for that. Understanding their role, uh, check it on LinkedIn. You need to understand the typical buying group structure and buying process ahead of time. So remember that slide that I showed earlier that most people, sales professionals, are just focused on the one-to-one -one interaction with the single prospect, but really that's, that's only recognizes half of what needs to happen for a, sale, for a purchase to go through. The other half is the buying process, so you really need to be shifting your mindset and becoming a buying coach. Um, so understanding these things ahead of time uh, is key. I need to understand their business. You need to understand current news about them. Uh, you need to edit your deck, you know, what you're presenting to them to include the things that you've learned about them. I can't emphasize that enough. It changes fundamentally the experience that your buyer has when there are personalized things being presented in front of them. Uh, so... Uh, then I recommend sending a pre-appointment email with a personalized note. Obviously, Inside Sales Vision is perfect for that. Uh, send a day of, day of the appointment email with a personalized note. Um, so that's kind of the pre-demo checklist. And a, couple, uh, a number of people have asked if we'll, we'll share the deck afterwards. I'm fine with that. Um, um, okay. So what I would do, so what I recommend is, taking this pre-demo checklist, and this, this process takes 20 minutes, you go through those things, and then you put that into a slide like this. So this is an example of what we would present to our clients. We would had have you know, their company logo up here. Um, we would then have details about what we know about them, what we know about their company, what we know about a use, you know, what our recommendation for a use case is based off, uh, on our research, and what we think the expected results might be. This, the conversation that you can have around a slide like this is incredible. If you're not doing this in your sales process where you're prepping ahead of time and then presenting something like this that guides uh, your discovery questions, um, you're really, really missing out. And I'm certain that you'll see an increase in your close rate just from that. So, <laughs> oh, let me get through these. <clears throat> Some nice animations. Uh, so the next, so that's kind of pre-meeting prep. So now I'm going to talk about a framework for what to do during the demo. Uh, I believe we have about 15 minutes left, and then we'll get to um, some more in-depth Q&A. The first thing that you should do in a demo is agree on the goal of the meeting. When someone uh, comes to the meeting, uh, you don't really know what their expectations are, and so launching into uh, or trying to, you know, demand that, that the meeting go a certain way can often end up in, in you know, misbet expectations, which is, so, uh, you know, it kills all deals. So, um, so agreeing on the goal of the meeting. So we would present a slide, something like this. 
that says, hey, I just, uh, you know, before we get started, I really want to understand what, um, you know, what you wanted to get out of this. Um, my hope is that by the end of this meeting, you can have, you've learned enough about consensus, you know, if I was demoing consensus, you've learned en enough about consensus that you can make a decision on uh, whether the next meeting makes sense for you. Does that sound like, so something like that, right? You're just confirming what the goal of the meeting is. The next thing that you need to do is present an agenda, an agenda that's going to support the or create a path to get to that goal. So the agenda that we typically present is, hey, let's first talk about kind of why this matters and what uh, what this you know what your interest is in us, why you agreed to a meeting in the first place. Um, then I want to kind of show you what I know about you and and the you know the research that I've done. Um, so let me kind of go through that. Uh, then I'm going to demo. Then I'm going to, you know, we'll talk about expected results and then next steps. This usually gets a great reaction from the people that we're talking to, and it creates a path again to the goal of the meeting. So once you've presented the agenda and made and made sure that they like it and support it, um, then you're getting into the why and the what. Now to them, it's uh, you know, to you, this is discovery, but to them, it's a personalized experience that they're not getting from anyone or anyone else likely. You know, presenting this slide with the research that you've done at this point allows you or guides your discovery uh, discussion uh, in a really fantastic way. So, uh, so once you've done that, you've done the discovery, now it's time to demo. And this is where you're fitting in this story. Right, so the demo typically, what, what I see over and over and over again is, let me just give you a brief overview of our product. I'll walk you through the features, uh, and, and, um, and you know, then we can, you know, we can see what questions you have. That is, uh, again, going back to if you're giving them, you know, showing them features without context, you know, or outside of the context of a story, they're not going to, it's not going to bring up the emotion, generate you know oxytocin and cortisol that needs that has to happen for it to be memorable, and you're also not going to give them a story that they can then go share with others. You're just giving them a list of facts. So again, in summary, don't give a list of facts. Do it in the context of a story so that it's memorable and emotional. Um, <clears throat> Now the the questions that were coming in were you know hey can you you know basically uh, you know asking for an example of how how would you tell a story like that on a software demo um, I'm going to put something together like I said and we'll send it afterwards because um, I I actually didn't prepare it for this but uh, I I wanted you to have the the story framework um, and then if as you're kind of thinking through, hey, how can I tell that story in, like while demoing the software? Um, it's a really valuable exercise and, and what you create is going to be better than what I can you know, share anyway. Um, but I, I will produce an example of that and, uh, that you can see. So then you go through the demo in the story and a couple of key points right, to remember. Your story should be user focused. It should follow the hero's journey. And don't leave out elements. I just, I've talked to so many people about this. They get into building their hero's journey demo story and they're, they, they feel awkward doing one part or the other. You just have to keep massaging it and working with it until you have every element of the hero's journey in there. I promise that will be the most effective. Um, make sure that you're using images. Don't be scared of PowerPoint. Uh, you know, use it. It's, it just has to be used in the right way and not you know 20 minutes at a time uh, and it's going to increase memory and then make sure that you're asking metric questions so we didn't we hadn't talked about this before but as you're going through your demo a lot of people they ask sort of confirmatory questions that are really weak uh, confirmatory questions don't do a lot but metric based questions do a lot so an example of that would be if I were if I were talking to Gabe and let's say uh, you know, I was asking, you know, so for consensus, for example, um, if I know that my product can uh, increase its close rate because uh, I can reduce the number of deals that fall apart uh, by the 
wrong message or the you know not getting the right messaging to the right stakeholders. I, I'm going to ask Gabe questions like, how many stakeholders are in your typical buying group? If Gabe doesn't know that, it already establishes me uh, or gives me authority to help him on you know to teach him about his buying group. If I say um, you know, how many deals do you know fall apart without having reached every stakeholder in the buying group with the right messaging? Well, they have no idea. So it's these these being these very specific questions, right? That bring that bring attention to the problem that you solve. Um, okay. So um, we're almost done. Uh, after you've kind of told your hero's journey, taken them along uh, that journey with you, made them the hero in the story, um, they're going to have some questions about specifics, right? Because you didn't go straight into the features and you know, the integrations and all of those things. So after you've done the demo story, uh, you need to make sure that you have a specific conversation around product fit. So what I recommend for something like this is a, a simple slide that really drives that conversation where you're asking the right questions. So for me, it might be, is buyer dysfunction a problem for you? If you don't agree with that, we don't have a lot to talk about. Um, can consensus, consensus fit into your workflow? If there's something about your sales workflow uh, that doesn't work with, with us, then, you know, we don't, again, it's not a fit. Uh, do we meet your integration needs? Um, then we're getting into buying coaching. Who else is involved in the decision? What do you need to meet their needs? So it's, it's, um, what, I've, what I see far too often is sales reps showing features. They might talk about benefits too, or they might even do a great job of talking about benefits. And then they just say, okay, what do you think are next steps? Um, this product fit discussion leads very nicely into a buying coaching discussion where you take control of driving the buying process rather than being relaxed about the next steps after the demo. I, that, this, that may be the most critical thing that you take away from this, um, this webinar is the fact that you need to ask direct questions to coach the buying process. So again, when you start to ask these questions, right, you're going to get information that you really should be capturing on this slide that you've been uh, showing them that you built before the demo and that you can send them after the demo. That, ca that gives them a really nice summary uh, and, and more digestible summary of what you talked about and what really matters. And again, they're going to remember this and use this more in their internal conversations than you just restating them or giving them bullets in a, you know, bullet points in an, in an email. So uh, use that slide again as a, as a fantastic tool for that. Okay, last step right, is talking about next steps and coaching the buying process. Don't ever say what do you think are the best next steps. Never, ever, ever ask that question. Before, they, before the next step uh, conversation has a chance to come up, bring up a slide like this that shows a timeline with specific steps of how a typical uh, client buys your product. That's, this should drive the discussion, nothing else. Open-ended next step questions are the worst thing that ever happened to sales, <laughs> I think, um, outside of dialing manually, but inside sales fix that and in a, in a great way. <laughs> um, so, you know, use your timeline slide to talk about the buying process. Uh, Ken just asked, where does the demo of the product fit in? So I didn't, I didn't do, you know, in the examples that I was showing, I didn't uh, show that. But the, the demo of the product fits in here, right? So after you've done the discovery, you know, walk through your discovery with, uh, that you prepared for, uh, answering some questions about what you didn't know, right? So you want to put down what you know here, but you want to have specific questions about what you don't know. And uh, they're, they, you know, clients are, in my experience, always happy to, to give those give that information because they see the, the reasoning for it. So right after that, you have all the context that you need, right? You've done your discovery, then you can get in and do your demo story, um, and which I didn't show in this. So Ken, I apologize. I didn't have a good enough example of that. Um, a lot of people ask for that, so I'm realizing that's, uh, that's key to this. But like I said, I'll, I'll produce something and, and we'll get it out to you. 
So that was it. Um, that was kind of, you know, you end with this timeline slide, uh, and then it really it puts you in a position where um, you can do the proper follow-up. So post-demo, this, this is where it becomes critical again. Oh, yes, uh, Aaron asked, are you saying edit the slide live? Yes, edit the slide live. Uh, live. That is what I'm saying. Pull that up and edit that slide live during it. Um, it, it makes them feel like the level of attention that you're giving them is, uh, is unique, right? They're not getting that experience from anyone else. Um, so uh, post-demo, if you've done all of this correctly, right, you, you took them along the hero's journey, you coached the buying process, you, you drove the, the timeline conversation, um, it, it puts you in a position where post-demo, you, you can be a project manager rather than an annoyance, right? Rather than saying, hey, I'm just checking in to see how your decision-making process is going, which nobody likes to hear, right? You have specific things that you can follow up on. You can ask them directly uh, for what they've committed to doing. Hey, you said you were going to talk to this person, um, you know, by this day. Uh, you know, were you able to do that? Right? Specific questions drive action. Open-ended questions get pushed off because everybody's busy. So, uh, the, it, it, you know, doing this correctly allows you to do, or sorry, the next step is doing what you committed to do. Um, coaching the buying process, right? Post demo, you're following up and you're saying, hey, we talked about, um, you know, uh, InfoSec being really critical to the sales process and affecting the timeline. Um, have you been able to start that process yet? Um, uh, and then lastly, enabling your buyer, right? Part of that uh, coaching the buying process is asking questions like, um, you know, so the who do you need to talk to? Well, I need to talk to my CEO. What does your CEO care about? Well, the CEO cares about uh, numbers, so we need to see an ROI breakdown. Great, I'm going to get you an ROI breakdown. Don't rely on the sales champion to create that ROI breakdown or whatever else they need. Get to the specifics, do the work for them, and uh, you know, use these, these frameworks, uh, and I'm certain that you'll be more successful. So that's what I have. Awesome. Awesome. You, well, Matt, really appreciate it. I think that uh, is some valuable information. I think we had a couple comments. There's definitely a lot of, of information. So for those of yeah. you who asked, we'll, we, we will, assuming Matt's okay with it, make this uh, make, make this presentation in one way or no, uh, another uh, downloadable or that you can get access to it. And certainly you'll be able to get access to this presentation um, on our website in our resources, insightsales.com resources, if you'd like to watch it or send it to send it to friends. So um, let's kind of wrap it up here. Um, I, and I do want to jump into the, the, the Q&A just with a couple of the minutes that, that we do have left. Um, please do, as I mentioned, we'll get this to you later, but do grab that downloadable document, how InsideSales.com and Consensus works together. Um, you can grab that in your resources here, and then we'll make sure we get you some of this tomorrow. With Matt and I, please do connect with us. Um, I assume Matt would agree to the comment of always happy to continue the conversation. Uh, we're offended yeah. if you don't grab us on LinkedIn or, or Twitter because um, we always like to debate and discuss these, these topics further. So as I move into the Q&A section, um, if you've got an extra hey, really, couple minutes, throw some Gabe. Oh, please, go ahead. Yep, sorry. Really quickly, I, I didn't get to, because I dropped off at the beginning of the call. I meant to, to mention this, but I am really excited about our partnership with you guys. So I don't know if everybody on the call knows, but um, Consensus has become one of the premier insider technology partners of uh, InsideSales.com, so, meaning we get uh, early access to integrate with them, um, so it's our product is now you know becoming uh, can become a seamless part of your process using inside sales, um, so that you can get the benefits of both. So anyway, um, we're also I wanted to throw this out there um, inside sales cust because we in, inside sales customers get 20% off of consensus. So wanted to throw that out there. Oh my goodness! Thanks. Oh, good to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, pr 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 appreciate that. So. Yeah, some great things as you start to see some of these technologies come together. I know that's a big problem. Companies saying, hey, i got so many vendors. How do these work together? And you're seeing a pretty strong partnership and some great ways that Consensus and InsideSales.com are building 
their platforms out together. So um, I've also flashed here another downloadable on optimizing your sales process. It's kind of a cheat sheet. Grab that if you'd like. You got the the web link. But I want to get to a couple of these questions, Matt. If you just have a, a couple other minutes, is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we got a question from Carolyn here. She says, if a picture has a retention sore, she says 65%. Um, the question is, what is the impact of a video? Is there a time and a place or a time limit for a video piece in all of this? Yeah, you're you're uh, you're speaking near and dear about things near and dear to my heart. Um, so I believe the place for video is not in a live demo, but before a, before a live demo and after a live demo. So there's you, you, um, video has actually shown to be um, the the most memorable asset that you can send static asset that you can send to somebody. A live demo is even better than that because of the context, right, and the personal interaction uh, that you can do. But the next best thing is definitely going to be video. And that's, it's, that's what our platform does. Our platform uh, allows you to uh, build and send and track video that's sent before and after a live demo. So we exist to educate the stakeholders outside of the live demo. Um, so, but I mean, Yes, video is super memorable. You can definitely communicate more in a in a shorter amount of time in video than you can in in a live demo. So it has its place. And again, I think that's before and after a live demo. Great, great. I I, I couldn't agree more. A um, lot of questions, Matt, around building the actual story. I know you alluded to that a few times. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I could give an example example in there. We got about fifty of those. So yeah, you you might want to, but. <laughs> um, we had Aaron, you know, Aaron stay, you know, um, would, would love to, would love to hear maybe a summary on, you know, if I'm trying to build a, a tight story, um, I know you kind of given us the framework, any kind of other thoughts you'd say on, Hey, if you're trying to get your story, start here. Yeah. So if you're trying to get your story, uh, inside sales has a great asset. That's a, an example of this. They call it, I think the day in the life. Of and it's it's basically a user story. Um, it might even follow the hero's, hero's journey framework. Um, but yeah, the the really key elements if in your that you could start that you could change you know literally this afternoon on the next demo that you take after this call or or next time you train your your team is just uh, when you're doing the demo, just add a narrative. Do it on the fly. It doesn't matter. Just make it user focused. Say, yeah, so you know your use case is this, and your use user is X. So I'm going to tell a story about how your user X would use our product to accomplish Y. So that, that's the first place that you can start for a really lightweight implementation of what I've been talking about, um, and then go from there. Is that is that what you were looking for, Gabe? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and I am going to show. Um, I'm going to send just everybody that link. I think um, um, it, it's it's the link to um, our user story, and um, we created it just as we were starting our partnership, Matt, with you. And so we got we, we included some of those elements. I don't know if it's perfect, but I think it's a decent sample because I know a lot of people are saying, "Is there a sample? Is there a sample to maybe see some sort of user story and how, how you kind of walk through that?" Um, one more click on the user story, Matt. Um, a lot of people have, uh, well, you know, when they're doing demos, they're 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 presenting to multiple people, and so coming up with a hero yeah. story. When I have a, a head of marketing in the room, and and they may use my technology, I don't know, slightly different. I've got a sales operations. I've got a head of sales. Um, do you recommend building a a demo for per persona, so to say, or how do you navigate that in in the demo world? Yeah, so um if if you're building so f for example in in our technology it it you know it's it's a single link that you would share with multiple personas or stakeholders and it, you know that the content would actually change depending on which persona is watching it. So before and after the demo absolutely when you're on the demo um I guess it's a you know you got to you got to call you know make that call in the moment, but I, w I would say stick to one one user. 
I mean, if you have sales and marketing both using it, you can't. You, that that's going to complicate the decision process. Typically, well, that's another story. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would I would recommend. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, but I think I think the, the key was I mean there is a time and place for that. So tailoring yes. certain content yes. to personas. But it sounds like during the yes. demo, if you've got a large group there, you've got to go with the. And, and I think we would all agree to that. Certainly, even in with our own product, InsideSales.com, sales operations involved in, in marketing, but sales is the primary, quote-unquote, decision maker or use case. And so maybe you choose yeah. that primary use case and you run with that that type of story. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're taught, you know, for, for yours, that's a really good example. If, 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 the, if your buyer is head of sales operations, then your user story – you need to they need you know they need to understand how the sales teams use it because that's their ultimate goal is to enable you know enable the sales team but there i think there also needs to be a hero's story where the sales ops person is the is the hero they're the focus of that story yeah the big mistake that yeah. most people make yeah the the big mistake most people make around these stories is making their company the hero rather than the the buyer the hero or the user the hero um, uh, yeah, they make it about them. Yeah, not the customer. I, right. I'm sure that happens often. Look how good we are. Look how big we are. Yeah, that, that, mm-hmm. that, I assume that's a problem. Dang it! There's a couple more um, questions I wanted to get to, but we're already over. We better wrap this up. Um, certainly, again, continue the conversation uh, with myself and Matt on on social. You'll get some of this material. Matt, really appreciate you, you joining. Any closing remarks? No, just. Man, I'm freaking passionate about this stuff. I love it. So if you want to talk about it, I'm happy to. Um, you know, and and then again, you know, check out how consensus and inside sales work together. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty, uh, it's a powerful one-two punch. And thanks everybody for taking the time. Okay, appreciate it. Have a great day.